What's going on, YouTube? It's your boy OG T Man in the day. We're back with another video. I'm just playing. Today we got five times rappers got killed over this thing. Bomb, yeah. It's gonna be some good videos, but without that being said, let's get started. ED. Rappers beefing. It's just how it goes in the hip hop game, and diss tracks are the main way to throw down. But some cats take the tracks too seriously, and sometimes it ends with somebody getting dropped. So here, are five times rappers got killed over some diss tracks. Starting with OG Man Man, who might say he ain't a rapper, but this dude dropped hip hop's most demonic diss track with an equally brazy music video. The track titled Truth wasn't just a diss aimed at his ops. It was a suicide note that eventually got him smoked. OG Man Man was one of the biggest hitters in the DMV area. And for context, that area had some of the most ruthless street dudes standing on business round the clock. From the OGs to the youngins as little as 13 years old, neighborhoods were terrible. As little as 13 years old? What the hell are y'all doing at that age? No, 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 no. Y'all are some crazy motherfuckers. I was a bad child, but not that bad. I wasn't murking no niggas at 13. That's crazy. And the ops were drilled, but OG Man Man was always there to up the scores. He wasn't just living in the trenches, he was the trenches. You could find him posted up on the block with his hitters any day, any time. He didn't care for anybody that played with his name in any sort of way, and was with all the smoke. As a matter of fact, he welcomed it with open arms. But in the hood, if you don't look over your shoulders, your head's gonna get blown off. And if you mess with an OG, you gotta stick to the lick. In this case, OG Man Man messed with a homie turned off Big Flock, and that marked the beginning of his downfall. You see, Big Flock, real name Charles Ulysses Bowman, is a Maryland rapper who's no less of a savage than his former homie, OG Man Man. Growing up on Maxwell Drive and Morrison Avenue, he had to cope with his dad being behind bars as he lived with his grandparents. However, when his granddad passed, his life took a turn down a darker path. The streets became his guide as he hustled hard, and with no more tears to hide, he turned his pain into stride. But in that life, he found rap, and around the young age of 11, Flock was already putting his pen to work, writing bars. He started recording on tape, but when he grew older, he realized rap could be his way out of the hood. At this time, he was repping the Thrax game and the crew would drop bangers like Iggity before they fell apart, pushing Big Flock to chase a solo rap career. Now where exactly does OG Man Man and his diss track come in all of this? We're getting to that right now. During the early stages of his career, Big Flock kept a strong bond with one of his homies, C. Diddy. Now C. Diddy held it down for him when things got tough. Not P. Diddy, C. Diddy, no Diddy. <laughs> C did it, not P did it, no did it. <laughs> Let me stop. And even his first mixtape, Triluminati, was recorded in C Diddy's living room. They were locked in real tight, but unfortunately, C Diddy got dropped. Although cops say he died when he got drunk and fell off a bridge. Now, at the time of C. Diddy's death, OG Man Man and Big Flock were pretty cool because Man Man had earned the reputation on the streets for being a certified hitter. He was always down to catch a body, no matter the stakes. Now, Big Flock and OG Man Man were a hard-hitting hood duo. They both served time in jail, both had hard rap flows, and both ran blocks on the street. But their friendship would break apart for two reasons, with the more important one being about some girl, obviously. I mean, we all know dudes acting a fool for a shouty. No one fully well should be onto the next faster than Kendrick can drop an album. This time, however, it was Man Man messing things up by violating the bro code and banging Big Flock's girl. So Big Flock found out about it and went on to diss OG Man Man in a song on his debut album, Glockism. In the song titled Intro, Big Flock said, And Man Man turned to informant, thought that he was real. He put on a good performance. That diss was Big Flock's way of saying OG Man Man was a rat for the feds. That was a big one, cause Man Man was behind bars when that song dropped, making him a target for gangsters in prison and even his own gang when he got out. Big Flock single-handedly tarnished OG Man Man's street cred. And in turn, Man Man wasn't about to let that sh slide. 
Once he made it out of prison, he got his lick in and dropped one of the most disrespectful disses ever. The lyrics to the track and even the video were so gory, DJ Academic straight up called it demonic. Listen, I made a gut call a couple months ago after hearing one of the most demonic songs. Fortnite, most demonic songs I've ever get heard. The track was titled Truth, and its video saw Man Man in a mask flashing his straps left and right at the grave of Big Flock's dead homie, C. Diddy. Oh. God damn. Oh. That's some fucked up shit. Oh. At the grave? What if he would have started shooting it? You know what? I ain't going to... We told you, see, Diddy and Flock were really tight. Well, Man Man wanted to piss the f*** out of Flock. Shot that music video of this diss track right in front of C. Diddy's grave. Some of the most hard-hitting lyrics to the song say... I know why you mad, because I'm f***ing your bitches. Stop playing with me and talking about I'm snitching. Rest in peace to Lil' Chris. Yeah, I know they f*** miss him. Don't trip. His whole squad gonna lay there with him. Holy shit, I mean, dude went on Big Flock dropping diss after diss throughout the entire track. But the height of his disrespect was talking about C. Diddy and pouring out bottles of Ace of Spades on the ground while the news report from C. Diddy's death played in the background. And after that, he popped in a clip of him lighting C. Diddy's photo on fire, increasing that disrespect to C. Diddy and his crew. As bad as it sounds, Man Man didn't stop there. He talked about how Flock wasn't a real gangster and how he handled his business for him, while also inserting another clip of a man falling from a building to mock the way C. Diddy reportedly died. Oh, the song did numbers with OG Man Man even considering making a full-time transition to rap, but Big Flock and his other homies made sure that never happened. You see, on June 12th, 2016, OG Man Man had gotten a phone call from somebody who wanted to come over to a cookout that was taking place in Southeast D.C. When he pulled up, it was already too late. Someone walked up to him with a burner and without making small talk, fired multiple shots into Man Man, ending his life on the spot. As expected, all fingers pointed to Big Flock as the man behind the murder. Subsequently, the cops raided Flock's home, finding more ammo than needed to start World War III. All right, we're exaggerating, but really, we're not lying when we say this man's house had everything a gangster would need. For oh, God damn. He's going to take on the fucking world. Do you see all those pistols? This nigga got a fucking crossbow. Who the fuck you beefing with, Tarzan? A woolly mammoth? Yeah, no, nah, I got... Yeah, no, nah, snipers all around. Top-tier semi-automatic rifles to narcotics worth thousands of dollars. Since there was no way to prove his involvement in Man Man's death, he was instead charged with illegal possession of firearms and drugs. He took a plea deal and got 45 months of jail time for this. And just like we already said, the honey that started this whole lame beef moved on. G Money. September 10th, 2017, Louisiana rapper Real G Money was outside the parking lot of his Baton Rouge studio on Dallas Drive when he got taken out. Rumors suggest that the hit was ordered by his childhood homie, NBA Youngboy. But why exactly would Youngboy have wanted him dead? Homies turning rivals is the type of sh that runs the rap game. It ain't new and it'll never get old. But in the case of G Money and Youngboy, things got a little too nasty. Now we gotta know Baton Rouge, Louisiana is a hardcore place to live. The streets are rough and gangs run deep. Crime and violence are everyday things and it's a constant battle to stay safe. The hood life there's intense and you can feel the tension everywhere. It's pretty much a war zone and you must never get caught lacking to thrive out there. For G Money, AKA Garrett Burton, he was covering his little homie's back and be a young boy. That was before Youngboy became the global artist he is today. G Money was four years older, so he guided Youngboy into the ways of the street. They were both cool until G Money had some stuff to do with NBA Youngboy's sister, Telly Golden. According to G Money himself, he fucked Youngboy's sister, and although Youngboy wasn't tripping about it at the time, it became one of their biggest issues down the line. As the years went by, G Money and Youngboy performed both under the group TBG, aka Top Boy Gorilla. But after a while, young boy cut himself out of that group and started his own label, NBA, standing for Never Broke Again. As the spotlight shone on Baton Rouge, NBA young boy and Boozy were two of the biggest names to go mainstream. Then young boy's relationship with G-Money became rocky until the duo fell out. 
August 2017, a month before his death, G Money did an interview with Say Cheese TV, revealing that he and Young Boy would never do music together and that Young Boy was still angry because he'd slept with his sister. Now, this probably was the first time their core fans had heard about that, so sh blew up online. Following that, G Money released a diss track titled Industry, where he straight up violated NBA Young Boy and his sister. Some lyrics of that track go like this. All you pussy n is lame, sneak dissing on them songs. I don't do it for the fame. See, you should be ashamed. I put a 30 up under my pistol. Your sister swallowed nuts, so I never kissed her. But I f with her, so I never dissed her. Now, after that track Great. dropped, NBA Youngboy and G Money kept beefing on social media, making the NBA and TBG rivalry even hotter. Less than a month later, G Money got taken out. Folks, we're gonna point fingers at Young Boy because of their beef. And right after G Money got dropped, Young Boy's crew got into a deadly shootout in Miami. But one question remaining unanswered is: Did Young Boy take out G Money himself? Well, the judicial system certainly didn't believe so. A member of the NBA, 26-year-old Lil Pap, was interrogated by police officers during which he confessed to have told his mother to leave their home because he feared retaliation. He also took both his mom and his son to hide out at New Roads, Louisiana, after G Money died. And the biggest blow on him was when he lied to the cops that he drove to Hammond, Louisiana to get gas the day G Money was killed. When in fact he was in Baton Rouge according to his device's location records. Shell casings yeah. on Jefferson Ave in Baton Rouge matched the ones from when G Money got clapped. This made detectives believe Lil Pap tossed the burner by handing it off to some folks on that same avenue. Pap's phone records also showed he was hitting up those people just hours after G Money got smoked. He was initially charged with second degree murder, but took a plea deal for a lesser charge of accessory after he was indicted on a new charge that suggested he simply was in the car with a group of people that included G Money's killer. Prosecutors alleged in this new indictment that Lil Pap assisted the shooter after he dropped G Money. Nonetheless, Lil Pap was sentenced to five years in prison, which he served concurrently with a three year sentence on a separate federal weapons charge. As for NBA Youngboy, well, let's just say he got some other sh to deal with. I did a video on him last time, boy. Nigga had so many charges, I couldn't even tell you. I can't even remember him right now. Y'all, if y'all want to see me with new equipment and y'all want to see me consistently loading up, like the video. I'm tired of this camera. I'm tired. FBG Duck. July 10th, 2020, Chicago rapper FBG Duck released Dead Bitches, one of the most dreaded diss tracks in hip hop, where he mocked dead rival gang members. But just three weeks later, he was dead. Now, while many believe this diss track was the motive for getting him dropped by his ops, the shit he'd done was way deeper than that. FBG Duck, real name Carlton D. Weekly, was born on December 6th, 1993, in Chicago, Illinois. This guy had seven siblings, and most of them were in the street life that came with the South Side. Now, his elder brother, Brick, was shot and killed by some gang members. And while Duck never wanted no smoke from all that hood violence, he ended up getting sucked in regardless. The majority of gang-related shootings in Chicago have been perpetrated by two rival gangs, O Block and STLEBT. Duck was a member of STL, and even as a teenager, he threw hands any time he got confronted by O Block members. Now, around 2009, he became friends with another gangster named Tuca. But just a few years into their friendship, Tuca got smoked for dissing deceased members of another gang, TYMB. Now, TYMB and O Block were cool, so they ganged up against STL. And sadly, Duck fell for their tricks. He became friends with King Vaughn, who only got close to him to get some inside information on STL. However, after Duck found out Vaughn was playing both sides, he and the rest of his gang jumped Vaughn on a bus. Now, this caused Vaughn to vow revenge on anyone involved, and fueling his hatred for Duck. By this time, O Block and STL EBT were in a full blown war, and the violence was inescapable. This was also the period that Duck got into the rap game. All the beef he had with rappers from Glory Boys Entertainment and OTF pushed him to flex his pen and spit bars. Chief Keef, the leader of GBE at the time, dissed Tuka Gang in multiple songs. And in retaliation, Duck and other Flyboy gang members made their own songs dissing Chief Keef and other members of his group. Duck also dissed Vaughn, Lil Dirk, and other members of OTF. Now, Duck was so out of pocket back then that he even made a song about the time his girlfriend stabbed him in the stomach. It was pretty crazy. But as the story goes, Duck's girlfriend stabbed him in the stomach. And in some visuals of his song, Will. <sighs> I 
C, 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 C. That's why I don't, that's why I don't fuck with bitches from Chicago. You're, you're stabbing me in the stomach? Oh, what is wrong with you? What? In my stomach? Like, really? You gonna stab me in my stomach? No, bitch, you're crazy. Day titled, Who the F*** is Dude? FBG Duck shows this stab wound. That's definitely some out-of-pocket stuff, but here's the thing. In 2017, FBG Duck released his biggest song to date, Slide. Now, this song was an instant hit. It was everywhere in the city. Radio, streams, clubs, everywhere around Chicago, even O-Block territory. That track went to gold certified, allowing Duck to score a record deal with Sony. And after the success of Slide, Duck tried extending his hand out several times to make peace with his ops to move on with his career. But Dirk and King Von wanted no peace with him. They continued dissing him and his people, dead or alive. So Duck returned the favor with his diss track, Dead Bitches. But now we already know how that story goes from there. Dead Bitches wasn't just a diss track. It was a violation to Black Disciple gang members. Some of those lyrics go like this. Said I wasn't gonna diss the dead, and okay, I did it. But nigga, T-Roy and OD, them dead bitches. Y'all heard about J-Money? Is getting dead the same way. Those lines were lyrical sniper shots aimed at T-Roy, OD, J-Money, Lil Boo, and Sheroid. All the members of Black Disciples who were each killed in separate incidents over the years. Again, that song made headlines, but for the wrong reasons. The Black Disciples gang placed a 50 grand bounty on Duck's head, and would even take it up to 100 when the dude was still breathing. So guessing these gangbangers were after him, FBG Duck posted a video lashing out on gang members who killed their ops while they were with kids. I've got four kids, three boys and one girl, and if I catch a nigga with his daughter, I'm gonna give him a pass, because that's the heart of me, and because I don't want them to take me in front of my kids. While he was making a point here, it almost seemed like he knew what was coming, and maybe he did, because two weeks after posting that video, he got taken out. 4.26 p.m. on August 4th, 2020, FBG Duck was assassinated by four people who got out of two cars and shot him while he was shopping with his girlfriend in Chicago. This guy was shot 38 times, receiving gunshot wounds to the neck, chest, and groin. Police arrived at the scene, but for some unknown reason neglected to apply pressure to Duck. He was still alive and moving 20 minutes after the shooting. However, the cops here didn't attempt CPR and instead allowed Duck to bleed out. By the time paramedics came... That's fucked up. Then got shot 38 times? Oh my Jesus. Well, he was still alive. So the cops, the cops must have been in on this. You motherfuckers is in on this. It don't matter what type of beef they. Y'all motherfuckers is messed up. No kidding. Y'all was messed up. That damn thirty-eight times. It was too late. Duck had lost so much blood he'd finally collapsed on the stretcher. After the first surgery, an hour later, he was pronounced dead. The crazy twist to this story is, had he been flown to the hospital in a more timely manner, maybe, just maybe, he would have survived. And just like he mocked his dead rivals, some of his ops did the same to him. After his death, rival rapper and Black Disciples member 600 Breezy dropped a track titled, Stop Playing, aimed at FBG Duck. The lyrics go, you get dead on that fucking block, this song's gonna get you shot next time your bitch ass is in the box. 600 Breezy takes it further, posting messages from his supporters, referring to him as a fortune teller with a crystal ball. And six months after Duck's death, his ops struck again by dropping his friend, BCR Measy. Mm. As of right now, six gang members have been convicted for FBG Duck's murder, with each receiving a mandatory life sentence. Tupac Shakur. Okay, okay, hold on. Before you say some zesty shit about how Tupac wasn't murdered off no diss track, give me a minute to talk about this, okay? Let me cook something up for you. If you've been a longtime fan of hip hop, you'd recall Tupac's famous song, Hit Him Up, which was essentially one of the most well put together diss tracks of all time. Now this song, or should I say diss track, was aimed specifically at all them East Coast rappers. Biggie Small, Sean Puffy Combs, Chino XL, Lil' Kim, Junior Mafia, Lil' Caesar, and every rap dude signed with Bad Boy Records. Some of the lyrics to the track go like this. First off, fuck your bitch and the click you claim. West side when we ride, come equipped with game. You claim to be a player, but I fucked your wife. We bust on bad boys, because fucked for life. 
Now this is hands down the most violent, eccentric, and over-the-top diss track ever recorded. It shaped the future for gangster rap, hip-hop, music, and entertainment in general. But while it had plenty of entertainment value, it wasn't made for entertainment purposes. It was literally a recorded death threat. A threat Tupac never got to carry out as he was murdered just three months after it was released. So, why do we believe that this was the reason he got dropped? Well, one thing you gotta understand is, threatening an entire list of rappers who ran NYC was definitely attracting some blow. And on top of that, Tupac ran on a dude in a parking garage after a Tyson fight, and then hours later, he was dropped. That guy was Orlando Anderson, a well-known member of the Crips. And it just happened to be that Marion Suge Knight, the owner of Death Row Records, which Tupac was signed to, was a member of the Bloods. A formidable rival gang of the Crips. Suge had not signaled this by wearing red throughout most of his public appearances, but has verbally acknowledged this information. Now here's the banger. In the 2018 documentary titled American Dream, American Nightmare, Shook claimed that Pac was also a member of the Bloods. I almost been more people dead. I was a red rag, so bam, they put a red rag on Pac. You try to play that gangster shit, but we M.O.P. for motherfucking real. And if this ain't some BS, then that means Tupac wasn't just a gangster rapper, he was an actual active member of one of the largest and most violent street gangs in America. It meant that he didn't just rap about gangs, dude lived that life to the top. Gang members get dropped every other day, or get their bums shipped off to prison, just as Pac was, even before his death. November 30th, 1994. Pac pulls up to the Quad Recording Studios in New York to record a few tracks with Biggie and other rappers already waiting for him. However, as he moves up the stairs, he gets shot five times by three hitters who also robbed him. Obviously, he survived, and Pac was convinced that Biggie ordered that drop, prompting him to release multiple diss tracks aimed at Biggie and his homies. This began that feud between the rappers, but on a larger scale, it began the freaking East-West Coast rivalry. This led Pac putting the pen down and recording multiple tracks, including Hit Em Up, where he dissed all of them. He would take every chance he got to let everybody know Biggie Smalls ordered the lick on him, right up to the moment he was dropped after the Mike Tyson fight we've already said. Now, some dudes believe Suge was behind Pac's murder, based on unverifiable rumors that Pac wasn't happy at Death Row Records and may have been planning to take his talents to another label. While that's possible, it didn't really make sense, because Suge was in the very same car Tupac was when them dudes ran up on him. In fact, Suge himself pulled out his chopper and started firing back while they sprayed his car. Call us crazy, that doesn't exactly sound like an ideal way to have someone killed. It'd be a great way to have yourself killed in the process. But till date, Tupac's murder is still a mystery in pop culture, with everyone expressing their own opinion and conspiracy about who ordered the hit. And quite frankly, it shouldn't even be that way. We don't find it surprising when other gang members or gang rappers are killed in cold blood. Nobody attaches any mystique to it, because it's what we almost expect to happen, unfortunately. However, if Tupac was really an active member of the Bloods and not just an affiliate due to his relationship with the Death Row Records founder, we shouldn't be questioning the reason for his death. I mean, would we question how somebody with a violent track record, gang affiliations, a deep hatred for police, millions of dollars, who'd almost been killed just a few years prior, could have possibly been murdered? And although it'd still be sad, book after book and documentary after documentary wouldn't have been respectfully written and made about it. Frankly, nobody would care. And don't get us wrong, I'm not implying we shouldn't care. Especially in Tupac's case, as he's still, to this day, one of the most influential rappers of all time, we're simply stating that most wouldn't. And with a diss track that deadly released barely weeks before his death, we think the motive behind his death has been in our faces all along. Lil Jojo September 4th, 2012. Chirac's own Lil Jojo got murked in a drive-by after he got caught up in beef he should have never gotten into in the first place. It all began on January 4th, 2012, when some homie dropped a 4 minute 40 second video on World Star Hip Hop's website. The video showed a little kid, maybe just 6 years old, straight losing his mind because Chief Keef had just gotten out of the pen. This video blew up with everyone asking who Chief Keef was, and it turned out he was a 16 year old Chirac rapper named Keith Kozar. Cops say he's repping the Black Disciples, while well, dude got locked up real quick for some gun charges, but luckily bounced back out. Once out, Keefe started grinding, dropping vids left and right, even from his grandma's crib while on house arrest. One of them joints was 300, with the 300 being a shout out to the Black Disciples. The internet was a buzz, with his vids blowing up. Just this new kid on the block. People were digging his vibe, feeling that raw energy, and even the street cred he brought. 
One of his videos, I Don't Like, racked up over 16 million views on YouTube. And even Kanye would even jump on that remix, taking Keep's Wave to a whole new level. Kanye hopped up on the remi? On the remi? Kanye hopped up on the remi? What? Hey, that goes to show you. All you need is connections. No kidding. At that point, the labels were all up on him. Despite all the gang talk in his rhymes, especially with Chicago's murder rate making headlines, Keith went with Interscope Records, signing a deal worth three mil, plus a movie deal. Now from the turf of another gang just three blocks away, we have rapper Lil Jojo wanting some clout of his own. So he starts a rap feud with Keith in the East-West Coast style of Biggie and Tupac. Now you see, Lil Jojo was a part of a group named 069 Brick Squad, a faction of the deadly gangster disciples. He posted a lot of videos dissing Keith, including 300K, where the K stood for killer. In this video, Jojo and his homies waved some heavy machines, sending a threat to Keith and his gang. Jojo's brother, Cash Out, takes it a step further, calling Keith's mom, recording her scared voice over speakerphone. That shit's mad brazy, and it didn't stop there. At 4.04 p.m. on September 4th, Jojo drops a video of him and his crew rolling into Keith's hood, talking mad smack at Keith's boy, Lil Reese. Oh, you can hear someone yell, I'ma kill you, and that wasn't a rap lyric, they meant it. Later, as it got dark, Jojo was tweeting that he was out on 69th Street, signifying that he was ready to throw sh** if some ops came through. But a few minutes later, as Lil Jojo was riding a homie's bike, a tan Ford Taurus rolls up and takes multiple shots at him, dropping him to the ground. Right after it happened, Keith took to Twitter to clown Jojo, saying that Jojo wanted to always be like him. Folks online didn't trip much about Keith rapping about gangs and guns before, but this and a dead team lit up the internet with outrage. People were heated, and there was even talk about Interscope dropping his contract over it. Keith then came out with some excuse, claiming that his Twitter was hacked. Now, no one believed that crap, and Lil Jojo's killer or killers were never caught. Here we are 12 years later, and the case has long been closed. He might be gone, but Lil Jojo will always be remembered by the gangster disciples around the world and the real ones who loved his music. That's the end of the video, but um, that last person, Lil Jojo, I ain't gonna lie, should've kept your shit out the beef. Like, if you wanted clout, you should've just kept rapping about actual thug life shit. But no, you wanted to go after Keith. A nigga who was not even worried about you for real. But yeah, this was a good video. Shout out to Rap Villain. Continue to grind. Can't wait till I get up there because boy is over with. Let's see these. This is the whitest narration I've ever heard. <laughs> Posting about G Money on his B Day is diabolical. Nah, for real. C Diddy turned to no Diddy. <laughs> ah, I was just talking about that, bro. But anyways, it's your boy OGT Man signing out. Diddy.